Our scripture lesson today comes from Genesis 2, 9, and then skips over to 3, 19 through 24. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit. And he also grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of no the knowledge of good and evil. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. Oh. Um, the man named his wife Eve because she is the mother of everyone who lives. The Lord God made the man and his wife leather clothes and dressed them. The Lord God said, the human being has now become one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, so he doesn't stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. The Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to farm the fertile land from which he was taken. He drove out the human. To the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed winged creatures wielding flaming swords to guard the way to the tree of life. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, may my words be of you. May your spirit fill me today so that those words that come out of my mouth are of you and not of me. Amen. So... Um, has anyone ever just felt like dirt? Anyone ever just felt like dirt? I felt a little bit like dirt this week as I was uh, fighting this illness. It's, I feel like every time I think it's gone, it, it rages up again. Um, you feel like dirt. And, and it may be that time that you were sick, but, but sometimes it may have been that time that, that you in, introduced yourself to a child, um, a young child. You, you ever notice that that young children will tell you exactly what they're thinking, you know, about you. They're going to point out your wrinkles. They're going to point out your fat rolls. They're going to point out everything about you that um, that you already may be insecure about as well. They're going to tell you that you look like you're 105 when you're 40. And all of those kinds of things. They, they don't have any sort of filter. They don't have any sort of sensor. They're just going to say it as it is. I've many um, many kids ask me how old I am, and um, I'm like, well, how old do you think I am? Well, 60. Okay. <sighs> well, let's just wait until I'm 60, see what I look like then. <laughs> but yeah, so it, it's interesting. They they make us feel like dirt, and, and the fact of the matter is, sometimes we feel like dirt because we are right. You all have heard it here first. You all, I am a dirt bag. Go tell the entire world that your pastor just called you a dirt bag. It's fine. Maybe next week the pews will be full. Because everyone will find out. And everyone wants to find out who this mean pastor is that called you a dirt bag. Everyone wants to find out who this pastor is that was right. I don't know either way. I don't really care. Just go out and tell people. We are all dirt bags. And, and it tells us in scripture that we are made of dirt. When Adam was formed... He was made and formed out of dirt, and then Eve was formed from him. We are all a bunch of dirt bags. And this Wednesday, we celebrated Ash Wednesday. I left the ashes up here so that we can see. That is, by the way, why the church still smells like smoke. I learned the hard way not to burn the palm branches in the church office. It was really cold outside, people. <laughs> But yes, and so I left some of the ashes, and, and, and we see these ashes, and, and we feel them, and we touch them to our foreheads so that we can be reminded that we are a bunch of dirt bags. We came from dust, from dirt, and to dust we shall return, right? But the thing is, when we read this scripture, there's something beautiful about it that it reminds us of as well. You see, it wasn't just ordinary dirt. I got in trouble last year when we were going through the series on, on growing and, and growth and, and farming and, and gardening, which I should never have talked about, right? Um, but um, I got in trouble because I called it dirt. It's not dirt. What is it? Soil. Yeah. We aren't dirt bags necessarily. We're soil bags. We're made from the most fertile soil. That's what Genesis tells us. We're made from fertile soil. He took fertile soil and crafted us carefully from the fertile soil. He made us beautifully and individually, and, and he took care and, and promise and, and love into making each and every one of us. Have you ever seen a kid play with Play-Doh? 
it gives me anxiety. I gave my niece Play-Doh this uh, for her birthday, and I learned the hard way that Type A people cannot be around kids with Play-Doh in different colors. <laughs> no, we cannot. Within five minutes, it was one color. <laughs> I was not a happy cancer. I had to step away. My sister had to say, you know, be careful. But you know, they just kind of throw it in together. That's not how God created us, though. God created us with care and with love and with perfection. So why is it that we take that care and that love and that perfection and treat it like dirt instead of soil? Why is it that we do that? It's, it's from a very young age that we start doing it. We talked this morning with the kids about candy, right? As soon as a kid finds their first piece of candy, their first piece of sugar, they're all about it, right? We love that that thing. I don't know if y'all know, there have been studies that compare sugar with um, the effects on the brain uh, of sugar are very similar to the effects on the brain of cocaine. It's addicting. It, it, we love it. We love putting it into our bodies. It's It's weird and it's odd how we take this creation that God has given us, this body that God has given us, and immediately we start using it for bad things. We either put bad things into it or, or we use it for bad things. And we see it already in this passage when, when God introduces um, Adam to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he says, don't, don't eat the fruit from that tree. And Adam goes and eats it anyway. Did you ever wonder, though, why God put that tree there in the first place? I mean, why would God put a tree in the middle that, that could create evil, that could invite e evil into the world, that could welcome evil into the world? Why wouldn't God, why would God want that? I think it's because God wants to give us a choice. From the very beginning time, we see this first spot, this first time of God uh, giving us a choice. And and one of the things that we see here is is not only this ability to choose, but it, it yields to us this knowledge about us. It yields to us. The, the tree gives us knowledge of good and evil, yes, but it also gives us knowledge of self. It removes our ignorance. It's a revelation of the, the will of God to us. We We now know the difference between good and evil. And a lot of times what happens is we take this, we take this passage and we say, well, now, now we've invited evil into the world. Now we know where evil is. Now we chase after evil. Yes, but it also gives us the revelation of good. We also know now what good is. We also know a little bit more about how good we are as well. It's good and bad. We have um, in the Bible, we have three creations and then recreations of, bod, bo, the, of the body. We were built to be this way. I don't, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but we were built to be a body. Did you ever think about why um, God would give us a fallible body? Why would God give us a, a body that can fail us? It's because body is important. Body is something that gives us a way to touch and community. What would body be if, if we couldn't touch someone's shoulder or shake someone's hand? What would body be, what would we be if we weren't able to hug someone and comfort someone with our bodies? Our bodies are important. Um, it's why there's so much uh, research right now and studies about how social media has changed the, the brains of teenagers and, and how it literally has created a disembodiment. So the, the teenagers now don't know what it's like to be in normal community, or in community at least as we have known it before. And what does that mean? What, how is that affecting our culture today? Body is important. And if body weren't important, then there wouldn't be three creation stories. We have, first, the story of Adam and Eve, of course. But second, we have the story of, of Jesus' resurrection. Jesus was, was resurrected in bodily form. And then we have the third, the promise that we one day also will be um, in bodily form as well again when we are resurrected by being part of Jesus Christ. The body is important. And yeah, so often we, we uh, struggle with what, what it means, what we, 
what we do and, and how we use that body, how we have used that creation. We sometimes abuse it and we sometimes um, can't figure out what it is that, that God wants us to do with that body. And, and early on, you know, I, I joked earlier about how kids do it to us, how kids point out our wrinkles and our flaws and our, our belly fat. And, and, and don't you notice, though, how often we do it to ourselves? How much money do you think people make off of recreating our bodies, off of fixing our bodies? I want to know how much money Weight Watchers makes. I, I mean, plastic surgery is big business, right? We all of a sudden start, and it starts very early, very young, with looking at the mirror and looking at the reflection of our own bodies and wondering what in the world God did to make our body the way that he made ours. But the care that he took in our creation shows us how much he cares for the stuff that's in us, the stuff that we are made of. And the creation of, of the tree of knowledge allows us to see both the good and the bad in us. It gives us the gift of discernment so that we see both good and bad. But maybe, just maybe, that gift of discernment is to gift us uh, the ability to do something about it. We now have the, the knowledge of, of what we can do. We're created from this fertile soil. And yet we, we cram our bodies full of fast food and fried foods packed with butter and and it's not just food. It's not just food that, that gives us, that, that um, is the way that we abuse ourselves and our, our bodies and our creations, but it's what we listen to. It's the music that we, we allow to enter into our bodies. I, I joked months ago, someone said that they had never heard the praise songs, and I said, well, you just hold on yourself because you don't listen to Christian radio then. Which I know not a lot of people do, but what are you listening to then? Are you listening to wholesome, good music? Are, are you letting that into your brain? Are you listening? Are you watching good movies, good wholesome movies? Are you allowing that in your brain? Or maybe it's the way that you treat other people. Maybe it's, it's the, the way that you treat other people in your bodily form. Maybe it's the way that you use your body to abuse others, to make them feel lesser. We have this beautiful creation so why not desire the best for the creation that God has given us? I think so often a part of the problem, and, and this is church culture too, is part of the problem is that we, we look at all the things. We, we look at this tree of good and evil, and we look at just the evil and not the good. We say these are all the things that we're failing at, and we're going to stop doing those. And... These are all the things that we're doing well, but uh, don't worry about those. We're, we're going to look at the bad side, the bad things of what we're going to do or of what we do or, or who we are, but we don't look at the good very often. We're given this knowledge of both good and evil, but we look at one and not the other. When we enter into, uh, into Lent and Ash Wednesday, a lot of times, what is it about? It's about giving things up, right? Well, this thing is bringing us further from God, so we need to give that up. Do you know why diets fail? Do you know why Lent sometimes fails with bringing us closer to God? It's because they're all about things that we can't have instead of the things that we can. I was um, talking to a friend of mine. <coughs> this has been several years now, and she was trying to lose weight, and so we were just talking about some things, and, um, and, and both of us were kind of both trying to lose weight at the same time. And I, I was saying... I, or I was saying, she was saying, we were just kind of listing off all the things that we couldn't have now. Can't have ice cream, can't have sugar, can't have fried foods, can't have um, all the things that we love. Can't have McDonald's, can't have Chick-fil-A, can't have Chick-fil-A, can't have Chick-fil-A. Um, can't have Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and then finally I, I looked at her and I was like, well, um, one of the things, one of the ways that I lost weight and one of the ways I was able to lose some weight was I stopped looking at food as all these things that I couldn't have instead looked at food as the thing that was going to get me through the day. Uh, food, I don't know if you're aware, every morning when you wake up, and, and I'm using this as a comparison, but um, it works for other things as well. Every day when you get up, you're, you're, car, you're, you're like a car in a way. Um, you're either empty or you're halfway there or 
um, you know, quarter way if you're like me and you like living on the edge. I don't know. Um, but every morning you, you wake up and you have a little bit of fuel left in you. And so you have breakfast, you add to the tank, and you use your tank every day. It's fuel. Well, if you're driving around a Porsche, are you going to put the, what is it, E83 in it? Probably not. I don't know much about cars. I know that you shouldn't do that. Is it E83? E85? 85. So, yeah, that's how little I know about cars. <laughs> you're not going to do that. And so that's what we do is we take our bodies, these beautiful creations of God, and we, and we put junk in them. And we expect to be able to go forward. We expect to be able to move forward. And like I said, it, it's not all food for all of us. When we, when we come to the table for Lent, a lot of us are looking at things that we need to give up. But instead of looking at things that we need to give up, maybe we look at the ways that we can use the things that we have to move forward, to move closer to God. Instead of giving up Chick-fil-A, maybe we look at the ways that food provides us energy and, and how much better we will feel when we, um, when we fuel our body as well. If you're, by the way, if you're slow and sluggish, that, that more likely is used to is because of the fuel that you're putting into your body. Or maybe um, maybe for you it's it's that uh, you uh, you go to the gym and you see it as torture, or you think that you're not going to lift weights because that's just silly. Maybe for you that's what it is. But if you look at things, exercise not as torture, but as ability to do things. Maybe. Maybe you don't lift weights because you like to torture yourself, but maybe you lift weights because you really want to be able to hold and hug and lift up your grandchild when they come running into your arms. Or maybe for you it's not that um, you want to give up this, this music, uh, this good music, this, this, these good movies that you love watching. Maybe, maybe it's not that you want to... Uh, uh, give those up just to torture yourself or to miss out on everything that's going on. But maybe it's so that you can feel energized and, and motivated and lifted up. I don't know what it is for you. That's why everyone has different kind of Lent and um, disciplines and, and ways of looking. Maybe it's that you want to read Scripture more. Uh, maybe it's that you uh, want to pray more. But um, I, I think that we, if we, once we look at our bodies as as a way to to come together with each other and once we look at our bodies as a way to, to come together with God, ways that we can use our bodies to come closer. It's the creation that they are, the tools that they are, instead of the things that hinder us. That's when we make progress. During when we come to the cross, we're aware of our own mortality. We come aware that we have used our bodies for things that have separated us from God and so the flow of diets rushes in. We remove things from our lives because we in, that we enjoy because we think that we are enjoying them too much. That God needs us to remove things from our own lives to enjoy Him. It's not that God wants to torture us by taking things away. It's that He wants us to enjoy Him more by giving more space for Him. So my challenge for you this, this Lenten season is to find some way some way that you may make progress in, in some form to free your bodies for closeness to God. Maybe it is for you the music that you listen to, or maybe it is that you do need to walk more. And, and by more, I mean more for whatever that is for you. It may mean five miles, or it may mean to the mailbox. I don't know what more is for you. Maybe for you it's committing to using your voice. Your voice is part of your body to tell stories to the next generation so that their lives can be more full. <coughs> Whatever it is, let's commit to using these glorious creations that God has given us for God's work to become closer to God and closer in community with Him. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear God, we are grateful for the ways that you have carefully, fearfully, and wonderfully made us to do your work. We know that sometimes our bodies fail us. But you have given us what you have given us in all forms, whether it's our voice, whether it's our brain, whether it's our ears, so that we might glorify you and, and have others glorified in you through us. Show us whatever it is we need to 
add into our lives that we need to make progress with so that we may go closer, may become closer to you. Closer to using these bodies that you have fearfully and wonderfully made for your service. Amen.